Hi, pal. Hi, Dan. How's it going? Not too bad, mate. Not too bad. How's lockdown been treating you? Same as everyone else, I think. Just bored out my mind at this point. <laughs> oh, bless you, mate. You written any more songs yet? Do you know what? It's been a weird, really weird year for that. I think um, I've come to realise that going out, seeing people, spending time with other musicians is really what gives you inspiration to actually play and write, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so not drawn there. No, not drawn any inspiration from uh, from COVID. Um, not to begin with. I think recently I've definitely found some more, but you know, I thought like from following other musicians on the internet and stuff, I couldn't realise it's been quite a universal thing. I think a lot of people really struggled with that, but yeah, yeah. Of course. Well, we'll just jump straight into it. Firstly, thank you very much for doing this. It does does mean a lot. That's um, a now, last time I spoke to you. Natura were cry. Yes. Why the change? A few different reasons. The okay. main one being is that cry was such a difficult name to find or searching for. So because it's just such a common word, you know, you'd, you'd search yeah. cry and for anything, you'd scroll for hours till you actually found us on Spotify or anything like that. So that became a persistent problem for us. Uh, as much as we love the name, because it is a great name, you know, it's very striking and yeah. short, and, you know. I mean, I, I couldn't believe no one else had it, you know, from back yeah. in the day even, but no. So we that was a big reason, as well as just feeling like we wanted to change things up a bit. With, you know, it's been about five years of doing Cry, and yeah. we felt as though that we changed a lot musically and the way we were writing, and we just felt like we needed a, a like a fresh, you know, blank, blank page, really. Yeah, that's fair enough. Where did the, uh, Notora come from? Well, we were spitballing names for quite a while and we wanted, you know, based on the reason I told you that we changed with yeah. being the name, we wanted something that was unique, that, you know, that it something sort of that stood out. Yeah, so we were spitballing names and we, we liked, I think, I think I just thought of the word notorious and I, I've always liked that word. So okay. we sort of played about with it, Notora, you know, it kind of stuck into mind and we searched it on everything. There was no one called Notora. So... Mm-hmm. You know, we had a list, and that was the one that kind of felt like fit the vibe the best. You know. Yeah. Nice. Um. Obviously, guitarist and vocalist. Yeah. Take everything back to the start. How did you get into playing guitar? Well, I was brought up in a very musical family, so I think I'd be quite worried if I wasn't playing music at this <laughs> point. Um. What do your family play? Sorry. What do your family play? Well, my mum plays a lot of stuff, but she <laughs> primarily plays piano. Uh, she's a writer she's um toured you know throughout her life and stuff so uh, she's she's a brilliant musician but she um she played with bjork's band the sugar cubes in the late 80s wow so okay. she, she got to do that and uh, amongst loads of other things she also toured with a band called the lucy show a bit earlier than that so there was the, very much that coming from my mum my dad was a guitarist as well guitarist and bassist so nice that's awesome. Would you say that they're sort of your inspiration or did you find inspiration from somewhere else? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely my inspiration. Because I think I grew up, they were, they were in the band together for years and years and years. So oh, wow. they would always have band practice in the house. They'd be bringing other musicians around. Uh, my dad, for a while, actually started a little record label. So there'd be bands coming in and out of the house all the time. So it was sort of like, I was just drawn to it naturally. I, I don't yeah. remember ever being told to play an instrument or told to pick up this. It just sort of happened, you know? Just from being around it all the time. Yeah. Did they write their own music? Did they, or was it called? Yeah. Um, they did bits, bits of both, but mainly they were in a, a band called Corky's Cats. It was sort of like a jazz fusion kind of band. Um, brilliant, brilliant band to be fair. Like it's, it's still on the internet if you search them. Yeah. Um, my dad played fretless bass in that band. My mum played keys and she sang, and they just wrote really good, good jazz kind of jazz fusion songs, you know. But they got a bit got a bit weird at times so okay i i, I won't uh, poke holes into that but okay yeah yeah um, with music yourself then with writing as i asked how do you go what is your process i think because you know I've, I've read all sorts like i always look up how bands i like do it for inspiration and stuff yeah. and it just doesn't seem to be a set rule like I, for me it's my kind of the, the only rule i seem to have is that lyrics tend to come later Okay. It's always music first for me. So it could be an idea, it could be a rhythm, it could be a harmony, anything could sort of 
could just kick start a, a whole thing so it, it could start something very small and then you should build on that and then vocals and lyrics come last where do you find your inspiration for your lyrics usually just it's I know weird you with, uh, i know you said with seeing Some... people but um sorry what was that uh, sorry I, I said i know you said that it's it's with seeing people and going out and being with people but do you take inspiration from for example anything that's going on in the news Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like, so, like it's the the lyric writing process is strange. Sometimes it could just be whatever's going on at the moment. You know, it could you know in the past it was like relationships or, and you know like the typical things that you know you sort of start writing off about. And then it sometimes it's what's going on in the world, what's going around around you. You know, but sometimes it could just be the lyrics can be spewing out don't make any sense to you until a year later where you read them and go, oh, okay, so that's what that was about. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it's strange. Sometimes I'll I'll listen to a song I wrote four years ago and only just about just understand what it's about now. <laughs> so it's, okay. it's quite odd. Okay. Well, I'm what sure has been... had that. say again? Sorry, because I know you write, don't you? I'm not sure if you've, if you've ever had that. With... To a point, yeah. I used to write stuff when I sort of started writing my own music when I was eleven, twelve-ish, and it was just it was just your basic stuff. It was yeah. like, um, I can't even think of anything off the top of my head, but it was very focused on that time or however I was feeling. And it was very sad, very mopey, early teenage years. I'm sure you understand that. Yeah, I think that's everyone's induction into songwriting though, isn't it? Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. And then you sort of grow from that and you find your own path. So for example, you may take stuff that's on the news. I might take something. I may have seen something that I liked whilst I was on a walk a field mm. that looks open and looks nice it can yeah. come from for me it can come from anywhere no I, i'd have to agree with you so going back to your question it's it's honestly it's so dependent on the moment isn't it you know like the the songwriting could be inspired by anything it could start off as anything it's that's what i like about it is the fact that it's really unpredictable you know do you sit down to write a song like you think i'm gonna write a song today or do you just sort of write it on your phone as you as you're passing somewhere I, I can't i can't sit i can't sit down and write a song if i want to it's it's weird like what i can do is if i've started writing a song or i've got an idea on my phone that i recorded from you know a few weeks ago i can sort of, okay i'm going to listen to that again and see if any ideas come up you know with a pre-existing idea but if i'm going to sit down and say i'm going to write a song i never do it's it's always you know one in the morning as i'm falling to sleep i've got to jump out of bed and grab a guitar because you've got something going on in your head and you want to see if it works you know always happens when you fall asleep mine's most active yeah exactly yeah 100 yeah uh, a lot of the time as well it's from jamming you know which is a big reason why this year has been difficult because we've not been able to yeah um but you know just playing in a room with other musicians you bounce ideas you get inspired by each other and that's a that's a really good way of writing as well for me anyway what's your favorite song that you've written it's it's one we haven't released yet oh okay but, um, we have i mean it's definitely something we're planning to record at some point but we ended up me and sam the bass player sat down one day and said do you want to just jam and write something that you know or like work towards writing something which just just for us you know we don't have any sort of pressure of, of being a certain way but basically we didn't plan to do it for the band we just wanted to write something that we like because we're both into really progressive stuff so we ended up writing this 10 minute long, just crazy prog tune. And we showed it to Darren, the drummer, and he, he loved it. And we've been gigging it, you know, before lockdown anyway. And um, I just, I love that whole piece of music. It's, it's I listen to it and do you, do you want to listen to a song you've written and go, I can't believe I wrote that. I've done it once or twice, yeah. Well, that's one of the few times that I've been sort of taken back by it and sort of taken out myself a bit and just gone I, that, I love that I absolutely love that you know so yeah. it's probably that song it's called Hold Fire and um, I'm okay. really excited to eventually get that recorded when are you think uh, uh, did you say you've got it recorded or you are going to record it record it uh, I think we are going to it's probably not going to be in the next batch of songs we're going to do because it is it's a bit of a it's a bit of a mission that song because it's a 10 minute thing you know it's probably going to cost the same amount as to record three other songs to do it yeah. but yeah, um, yeah, probably works. hopefully next year or this year awesome have you got any songs already recorded that you're ready to release um no we basically just finished just released the last song that we had 
we're quite yeah. lucky because before COVID, we had three songs, all pre-recorded, mastered, mixed, or, and you know the rest of it. So we were lucky that we had songs to release throughout this year or yeah. 2020. And um, we released the last song, Silver Screen, in December, and that's the last song we had. So we're gonna we're looking at getting back into the studio as soon as we're allowed to, basically. Yeah, of course. Which studio do you use? Well, usually. Uh, we would go to Par Street in Liverpool, but that shut down Safe last year. Down, yeah. Shame. But we um, so. Well, the guy that we record with, uh, who's sort of who does our mixing and engineering and producing, he's called Tony Draper, okay. and he usually worked from Par Street as his sort of resident studio, oh. and he we'll, we'll just go wherever he goes basically because um, we're really happy with the results we get with him so he knows your sound as well yeah no exactly like he, he really gets w what we're going for and i think once you find out you don't really want to let go of it you know no of course not as with um i won't name a name or a studio um but as with someone and i went to them for two or three songs i sat down with them i told them exactly what i wanted and i said to him i want on this particular track i want drums which i got a session drummer in for on bass, piano, and the slightest bit of guitar. I showed him the guitar that I wanted. I played it for him. We recorded it. And the track that I got back was not my track. It was something completely different. So as soon as you find someone like Tony Draper, was it? That's it. Yeah, as soon as you find someone like him, that's when you just, you want to stick with it. You don't want to go anywhere else, so I don't blame you. Absolutely. I've, I've been in the same position as you. Our first EP as Cry, we recorded um, somewhere, which again, I won't mention, because lovely guy just didn't get what we wanted at all. And we, we got it back. And I, I wanted to cry. You know, I genuinely felt like I wanted to cry because it's just this wasn't what we had in mind at all. You know. Yeah, I've got a feeling, obviously not naming any names, when we spoke a couple of years back, I think it's the mm -hmm. same place. Yeah, maybe. Um, I mean, I know other people have had great results there. You yeah, know? it's so do just, I. I think, yeah. I, I see stuff that's posted, not just with that one studio, but different places. And I just think it's, it's good to see as well the different sounds that people can make. I can, you see in the background, I've got mics. I will happily record a, record a guitar, the acoustic guitar that's just over there. Mm -hmm. And it'll sound how I want it. Whereas if yeah. I went to someone, I know that it wouldn't be the same sound because they'd put almost their sound on it to a point. Yeah. And well, at the same time as almost not wanting to change the sound, I appreciate how sound engineers put their own taste on it. Yeah. To a point. Well, definitely. But you've got to find people that complement what, what you do, don't you? Like you were saying before, it's, it's finding someone that works with you, you know, has the same kind of vision and the same end goal. But, um, I mean, you do a bit of production yourself, don't you? I, I do a slight bit, mostly guitarists, yeah, sing yeah, songwriters. Yeah. I'm the same, like, I'm massively into production. That's sort of my other baby, apart from playing. So when, when, you, when you do a bit yourself, you kind of, you know, you know bits and you, you kind of know the process to get what you want. So it's, it's, it's a big deal putting that in someone else's hands, isn't it? Hugely. Do you get what I mean? Hugely, because yeah. you've got this idea in your head. And I don't know about you, but I know a finished product before before I've even played it or recorded it. So yeah. when I went to this studio, for example, I knew exactly what I wanted. That's why I said to him, drums, bass, piano, slight bit of guitar. And when I got back the song that I, I hadn't asked for with all the guitar, all this lead over the top, it was the same as you. I was ready to just, I was ready to cry. I was like, this is not my song. But doing it myself, I re-recorded it myself as soon as I started to get a bit more into it and it sounded like what I had in my head at, at, at that time. So it's it's very hard to put what is in your head to another person. Yeah, no, 100%. Like we, um, when we go to a studio, we usually bring demos with us because I, I usually record, you know, an okay sounding demo of the song. We usually with quite a lot of pre-production already on it. You know, there'll be vocal effects, there'll be the general sort of, the sound of how the kit should be, the, how, the way that everything should sit and, and the way they should sound generally already done in a demo. So that's sort of like, can you do this but better? You know what I mean? No, <laughs> that's I how we go about it. 
I get that. It, it, at the end of the day, it's as you say, it's your sound, it's how you want it, and you're trying to project that onto someone else to try and make them understand. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I, personally, I'd never thought about doing the demo, but that's a great idea. <laughs> no, it's it's good because you, you get an idea then of sort of your end, your end goal physically in front of you and you can listen to it and go okay that's where i want to go but obviously you want it to be because a lot of the time if you're doing demos at home you don't have all the the outboard gear and, and the, the the acoustically treated room to, to really get the best mix yeah. it's more of a here's, here's how the production wants to be you know yeah no of course i get that. i mean in here as i say it's, it's a small room it's it's a three by three um mm -hmm. it's soundproof though the acoustics are nice but obviously i wouldn't have a space for a drum kit for example, yeah, but I can make a nice guitar sound. It, it's mm -hmm. as you say, it, it depends what you have, it depends what you have, and it definitely depends on how you use it. If you've got someone who's got, say, for example, I don't know, sound engineering student using a big, um, I'm going to use a studio. Have you ever seen factory studios in Cheshire? Run by yeah, Simon I've Jones. I've never been there. I think I've heard it mentioned. Yeah, they've got a big space. They've got they. You could fit anything in there, basically. If you had someone who was a sound engineering student behind that desk, I think they'd sort of worry a little bit because they'd not experienced it. But if you had someone who maybe had the experience, had the courses, did all this, did all that, and built their way up, that's when you get the sound that you want. Yes. Moving on then from recording, looking yeah, at yeah. live playing. Yeah. What would you say, or I'll tell you what, I'll take it back a different question. Do you have any stories from the road that you can share, which may be PG, but still a bit funny? <laughs> no, the, um, yeah, definitely. We've, there's quite a few. Um, there's some sort of funny, funnier short ones. There's some that are just bizarre, but the, the okay. one, one that springs to mind straight away is that um, our drummer, Darren, is, is also into classic cars. So he's got a 1956 Austin A35. Beautiful car. But Lovely. Like 60 years old, you know. <laughs> but we got a call um, to play a local gig very last minute because someone had dropped out. And we were like, do you fancy it? Yeah, go on then. And uh, he was round at mine in the car. So we set off to his house to go and get the van so we could get the gear. And the car breaks down. Uh, just like a mile from my house, the car breaks down. So he just, without a word, he just steps out of the car, goes to the boot, comes back with this massive handle, this crank handle, and just shoves it in the front and just cranks this car <laughs> until it starts again. Oh, wow. And we just, we, there we go, off or working. And then it's, it just baffled me that, that just, you can do that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like if you had a newer car, you'd be you'd be screwed, wouldn't you? You know. Oh God, but yeah. no, he just grabs this this crank handle, and we're 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 off again. We're gone. It's great. But that yeah, that that, that, that was funny. Um, we we did. Uh, we were quite fortunate a few about five years ago to play a support slot for We Are Scientists. Um, they wow. came and played a gig in Carnarvon of all places. Okay. And uh, we got contacted by the guy that was putting it on because he'd seen us, uh, seen us play a couple of times, and he offered us the gig. And that's probably the biggest gig we've done to date. Actually, that was a really good one. But we were still quite new to the whole live gigging thing at that time, yeah. and we didn't really understand the whole rider thing. You know, like when bands turn it to venues, a big bands, they get a rider. Yeah, we didn't really get that. So we were in this VIP area upstairs with the band, with We Are Scientists. Uh, lovely guys, by the way, you know, really down to earth. But, and there I was eating their rider in front of them, just <laughs> eating their crisps, eating all their food. Not, not a clue what was going on. Uh, they were too polite to say anything. And then their manager came and found us and sort of told us off for, <laughs> for doing that. That was funny. Oh, Great gig. Yeah. Where, where, which venue was it? It was um, the old Market Hall in Carnarvon. Okay. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's an active venue, but I think for sort of, if, if there were bigger gigs to come through, I think that's what they would clear the space, you know, because I think it was an old, yeah, like an old market, but there was a nice stage there and a good, a good space and a balcony upstairs, which is where the VIP area was, but it's good. Oh, lovely. 
I've spoken to other people already, obviously, and they sort of not just musicians. So my question for you now is, are you artistic in any other way than guitar or vocals? For example, <laughs> some are artists, some are playing random instruments that I've not heard of. Anything you um, Well, apart from guitar and vocals, I, I do play drums and I do play bass as well. A little bit of piano, but um, drums was my first love, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. So before um, Cry or playing guitar in bands, I would play drums. My first ever band, um, like gigging band anyway, was with the, our current bass player, Sam. He was on bass, I was on drums, and there was a guitarist and a vocalist, and we used to jam out like Wolf Mother and Queens of the Stone Age. And stuff okay. Like that. Nice. Awesome. So, so do you miss playing drums then? Yeah. No, I, I absolutely love playing drums. I. I, I'm not sure if you're a big Dave Grohl fan. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so I'm not sure if you've seen him talk about... Oh, yes? Yeah, got a... I, I didn't a even see that. I'm not even... <laughs> but, yeah, that seemed really passive-aggressive then, didn't it? <laughs> it's like, I'm not sure if you're a Dave Grohl fan. Um, but, he, you know, he talks about... sort Because being a drummer first, the way he writes on guitar is very much like a drum kit. Yes, it was like, um, something like kick drum, then it was... Uh, the top two strings were like the the bass, the kick, and the floor tom. Then it was the mids, and then it was the cymbals or something. Yeah. So like he has that whole sort of philosophy about writing um, guitar in the way of thinking drums. Like I, I I'm not the same, but I get it. Like when I heard him talk about it, because because I came from drums first. I'm a very rhythmic player. I work very well with drummers. So like. Yeah, my, my playing has become very rhythmic because of it. Like, there's a lot of funk in my playing because I just love the feel of, and, and the percussive kind of vibe of playing funk and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's definitely rubbed off in my guitar playing. Fair enough. Well, go to Darren for a second. Mm -hmm. Would he ever write something and you write something over the top of it? Or is it always yourself who would write first? I think it's... You know, from experience, the reason I actually switched from drums to guitar is because it's kind of difficult to write uh, on drums, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think there have been times where he's sort of, you know, been he's laid down a groove or a, or a beat and I've sort of jammed and then something's come from it. But it tends to be um, myself or, as of fairly recently, Sam, because obviously, he, well, we all play guitar, you know. It's, yeah. that, that's quite useful. But Sam is a very good writer too, and he started... He's, he's sort of recently found the confidence to sort of put forward ideas himself and we've been working on them, which is great for me because I love working with other people's ideas as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, jumping on then again, how we're speaking at the moment through the internet, how do you think internet, social media has impacted on music? So not just necessarily listening to the likes on Spotify, but new artists coming out. How do you think it's help them or put them down i think um i mean i've got pretty strong opinions about the internet in general i think it's a very two-sided coin you know there's a lot of good and there's a lot of maybe not so good but i mean the internet really flipped the music and the music industry on its head when it sort of introduced the the option for piracy and stuff like that because obviously record labels their whole thing was entirely based on physical sales wasn't it so they had to approach things very different. You have to be a lot more cautious signing bands. Like it just it's just not the same as it used to be. But in the same sense, you know, it's given a lot more artists opportunities to be heard. Yeah. You know, by you know, with YouTube and you know, even live streaming and as of recently, stuff like, you know, uh, TikTok and anything that's popular that has a a form of that gives you the option to sort of upload content, you know, it's it's a way of of promoting yourself but like I said two-sided coin there's, there's that side to it but also I feel like you know for some people I think some people take music more seriously than others don't they some people do it as a hobby yeah. some people some people really want to make a career out of it and I feel like for those people for the people that really want to make a career out of it I feel like the sort of market's very saturated because there's just so much more out there and so much to fight against to be seen you know, there might be 10 people that, you know, don't take it seriously, which is not a problem. At the end of the day, there's, there's no rule, is there? But no, there might be 10 people that maybe, are, you know, just starting out that put videos out there. One person who's put their 
blood, sweat and tears into a song and they might not get heard because of it. You know, yeah. there's very much, I think it is a two-sided coin personally, but why, what do you think? I completely agree. Um, I look at Spotify specifically a lot of the time because I, I don't have it personally. I just use the free one. But mm -hmm. um, you look at Spotify, you can stream any artist. I put my stuff on there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's controversial what I'm saying. I'm almost contradicting myself. But I put my music out there so that people can go and hear it. But then to the same point, they're paying so that they can listen through Spotify. I'm paying so that I can put my music on Spotify and then per something like 100 streams, I'll get about a penny back. Mm -hmm. So it works in both ways. It depends whether you want to make music full time or whether it is, as you say, just a bit fun. Yeah. If it is just going to be a bit of fun, then that penny per 100 streams isn't, isn't a huge issue. But if you're trying to make it full time, you need to find another source of of streaming because mm. Spotify is not the way I think you know like like what I was saying before about record labels it yeah. a lot of the the you know the industries and the artists income was largely based on you know selling physical copies so it would have been vinyls cassettes CDs you know up till the internet and then since that piracy sort of just dramatically dropped the amount of the, the you know the sale figures of CDs for example so artists and, and record labels and, and industry people wouldn't be getting nearly as much for that. So I think for artists anyway, I think it's become massively reliant on touring to make money and selling merch, which, you know, and then record labels have started the whole 360 deals where they just cover everything so they can, you know, keep making money. But, you know, obviously this past year has been difficult for that because of no touring. Of course, yeah, it has been difficult. How has obviously not playing affected you? Not as bad as other people, because I think, you know, I know quite a few people who are, you know, who rely on gigging for their income. Yeah. I feel actually quite lucky that I don't at this point, because I have another job, you know, like, so I've, my income's been fine. We weren't making money from playing gigs. We were just obviously playing gigs to try and get ourselves out there at this point. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there that completely rely on, on gigging, you know, covers bands, for example, wedding bands or people that are big enough to sell out venues. So I think, I think for us, you know, I speak for, for everyone that's sort of in my position, it's just been more of a downer than anything because for a lot, you know, a lot of musicians are, are quite introverted, really. They rely on those gigs to actually go out and see people and to blow off steam like some people go to a football match and they'd come back feeling like they've let out a lot of steam. Like we do have the same with the gigs, you know? Yeah, so of course. I feel like a lot of people have been struggling, maybe mentally more than anything. Yeah. I completely agree with you. I personally haven't played a gig for two, three years, but it's with not being able, like actually being told you can't play that has made me sort of sit down and go, you know what? I had a good thing. I really enjoyed it. I loved it got to let off some steam i had a buzz from it people yeah. singing back people dancing i had people coming up and taking my mic sorry my mic and going off and singing with it yeah that was that's something that i miss and yeah. it is as soon as we're allowed to i know the first thing i'm going to try and do is book a gig at my local pub yeah like that's it's something that you can't replace is it with them um, with the screen or the internet it's it's that atmosphere isn't it it's exactly it's, I think the best way to promote yourself as, as a musician is to is for people to stand in front of you and see you do it yourself. Exactly. I mean, you could, I could very easily sit here, put a live stream on, grab, grab a guitar, and I, I've seen a couple of people do this, but charge to watch. I get that. I understand that they're trying to make a bit of money from it. But me personally, I wouldn't pay 10, 15 quid to watch someone on here. Yeah. That's just me personally, because I would prefer to, I know, again, we can't, but go to a gig and then I'd pay 10, 15 quid to support a local artist. Yeah. But I know as well, if I wanted to see, for example, Foo Fighters, as soon as we go back to not whatever new normal is going to be, a gig is going to be 100, 120 quid because they're going to have to make up for the past, well, it's going to be two years by that time. Yeah, it's going to be rough, but it is. It is. But this is when uh, new musicians are going to come out. 
Yeah, I think, uh, especially after this year, there's, there's going to be a lot of people that have just sort of gone, that's okay, I'm done now, you know, and then focus on something else. But I think for the people who've stuck it out and going to try again, I think it's going to it's going to be a new breath of fresh air, isn't it? I'm sure. sure. There's going to be loads of new music as well. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited for it. I'm trying to be as optimistic as possible. Yeah. Because that's all we can do at this point, isn't it? You know? Exactly, trying to look on the positive side of everything. Yeah. Looking at a new musician then, is there any advice that you would give them? Say, for example, they're just starting guitar or they're just starting singing drums or on the opposite, they've been playing for a little while and in a couple of months time, they're looking for their first gig. What advice would you give them? Don't put, I'd say don't put any pressure on yourself because I think first and foremost, music should be because you love it. You know, it should be for you before anyone else. So if you go on stage and you have a great time, even if you play to one person, that's all that matters at that point, you know? I've done and that I a think, couple of times. Yeah, no, me too. Everyone's been there, you know? Um, I mean, we've done gigs, you know, three, four years into our career and still played to an empty room. And it's just like, you just got to take it on the chin, haven't you? Just treat, treat it as a free practice or something. Exactly. But, uh, I would also say, you know, for maybe musicians starting out that want to progress and find a band or you know just generally improve is to play with other people when you know when you can um, play with other people because I feel like that's the quickest way to improve mm. well that's something then how did you find Sal and Darren uh, how do you mean it's, oh as in so, uh, okay so as in how did I discover yeah. them <laughs> yeah yeah pretty much um, that I got you um Sam is a an old friend from back when we were about 15 it's I met him because a school friend of mine wanted to start a band, which is the band that I was told you about yeah. that I played drums in. Um, he was in, I'm not sure if you come across the Rock Project. I have, yes. I was in Mould. Um, yeah, so um, I, I, that's one of my jobs. I actually teach, at the moment, teach drums at, at the Rock Project in Denby. Oh, but good. that Rock Project in Denby um, is where uh, Sam and another friend from school, my friend, met and decided they wanted to start working together. And they got me in on drums. That's how I met Sam. And then after that band ended, we just stayed friends because, um, you know, we really hit it off. Yeah. And Darren was a few years later. When I moved from the first band to the second band, mm. um, I moved to guitar and we just joined a covers band with, um, with some new people. And he was in the friend group. And eventually he became the drummer for that band. And then we've just played, played together ever since. About seven years, seven, eight years now. Yeah. Wow. And then, you know, Sam joined what was Cry later on. And yeah, it's, it just feels, it feels right now. Definitely. You're happy with your little trio? Yes. I, don't, I Yeah. Like, I think when you get on stage and you look around and you just, it's like home, you know, yeah. <laughs> it just feels very comfortable. No, I get that completely. But, um, yeah. I get that. Um, last question then, because we've spoken about everything. We've spoken about the internet covered, obviously. The thing that everyone seems to be talking about, COVID. What is next for yourselves? Obviously, I know you say you're going back into a studio. Are you looking for an EP? Are you going to do an album? Are you looking for a tour next year? Or I think wow. what we're going to do is probably record the songs and then start because we've got a couple of friends and, and people involved in, in industry industry friends that might be able to help us out with that decision. You know what's best. So I mean, releasing singles has worked has worked really well like we weren't able to record a video for the last song yet because you know, obviously we couldn't but yeah. um i think yeah is record the songs and once we have them is then decide what to do in terms of whether we release them together release them individually but i think we just got to keep writing just, just keep pushing as hard as we can that, that's all we can do yeah. I, I think it's so uncertain because um we i want to say we were this is very much again a two-sided coin but when we first started when we when we um launched Natura it was right at the start of the lockdown it was literally a week into the lockdown we had planned to uh, to um launch Natura and it was a blessing and a curse obviously we have not been able to gig yet as Natura but um everyone was at home when we launched so yeah. everybody saw it <laughs> you know what i mean i don't think we would have would have had as much um interaction and 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 you know, instant sort of reaction to what we were doing if if there hadn't been a lockdown. So we're trying to look at it positively, but 
yeah, I'm just very excited to show people the new songs we have. Brilliant. What we've been working on. That's nice. I was say, cheers for doing this, mate. It really means a lot. Um, I'm just trying to almost start to build a community again because you take the likes of Chester and they've got a full musicians community, North Wales. I've found that we don't really have too much. So what I'm trying to do, as I say, is build this as much as we can, try and speak to musicians, see what you're doing. That's it, really, and promote yourselves. So well, speaking of that then, where can people find Natura? You can find Natura by searching at Natura UK. So if you search Natura UK on any platform, you'll find us. Brilliant. That's nice. Perfect. Cheers for talking to me today, mate. Honestly, thank you for having me on. It's been really nice to just talk about music again. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's been so long. But uh, no, I really appreciate it, mate. And best of luck with, with this and, Cheers. and launching. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Have a great day. You too. Take, take care, pal. Yeah, See you soon.